Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Welcome to the Thursday night edition of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. I'm always appreciative to have all of you here as well. Ron Felber is here. We're going to talk about The Unwelcome, the curious case of Clara Fowler, a true story about demonic possession. And Ron's mustache, I'm going to tell you right now, is kicking ass and taking names tonight. So beware of that. Just It's impressive. Very impressive. You'll see it in a minute. I want to say hello and uh, give the gold medal position to race fan again tonight and be with a silver SJ with a nice bronze medal. Kanashev, Chris, Bar Madison, and Woopoo, how are you? Dogface Simon in Australia, thank you for kicking off the Super Chat. See, now that's a lip blade you pay for. Rock and roll, Ron, right there. That's what we mean right there. You know what I'm talking about, Simon. Karen in the Woo Train, nice to see you. Hi, Stephanie Kenny Blankenship at Dragonfly. Cosmic Joe, Eternity Eternal, good to see you both. Vanessa, thank you for coming on in. Tim Mothman and his goatee, two separate entities. Dear Slayer, thank you for joining us. Mama Susan, good to see you. Desert Rat is back. Desert Rat will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Continuing on here, Bobbert, nice to see you back, my friend. As we continue on with Roll Call, W. David Page, Digger Dog, Wildberry, nice to see you guys. Skip to Malou, thank you for coming on in. Paula Foss has returned. Paula Foss will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. T. Tui, you're early. Yay, good to see you. And Paramarv, thank you for joining us. Also, Cosmic Joe, thank you for that lovely super chat, my man. Very much appreciate your love and support of SOR. So thank you very much. And continuing with our roll call, there's Brown Dwarf. Good to see you. And who else do we have here? Let's scroll on down. There's Brandon Coast, the pride of Powell River. He's a paper king, people. A paper king. Yep. Aloha, Dave. Laura Lobs. And who else do we have? Noble Patrick. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for coming on in. Sparkles over on Facebook. Good to see you. As we continue on with our roll call here. Who else is next? Who wants to be next? Well, let's take a look here. It's Human Carl, everybody. Not to be misconstrued with Alien Carl. Human Carl, a great veteran of the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service, Human Carl. We love you, my man. Hope you're feeling better. Scrolling on down, NHI, Susan Alloway, Michael Fontaine. Good to see you all. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show and we're going to continue on with roll call momentarily. Pol Pot, it's been a while. Thank you for coming on in. As uh, we're going to have a good show tonight. Ron Felber is here with his new book. And it's always a good show when Ron is here. Trust me on that one. It's one of my top 10 guests. 100%. 100%. And uh, we're going to get to uh, everything else momentarily. I want to remind all of you that if you have not purchase your tickets for the uh, Spaced Out Radio third anniversary fan party in Reno, Nevada, make sure you do. Go to info at spacedoutradio.com, info at spacedoutradio.com, and book your tickets today. we got a bunch of great guests coming to hang out with all of you. And uh, Richard Hauser, how you doing? Jerry Carter, thanks for coming on in. And we're going to start the radio side here. 
Hello and welcome to the radio and podcast side of Spaced Out Radio tonight. We're talking demonic possession with author Ron Felber and his brand new book, The Unwelcome, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. It's going to be a great show tonight as we await Bill WD-40 to come on into the chat room and lube us up for tonight's show. We are in the middle of roll call right now. And once again, the super chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And don't forget to shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. You're going to want to wear our clothing anywhere in public where you're not going to be embarrassed. It's more than just a painting t-shirt or gardening or mowing the lawn or going to garage sales or digging uh, through the dumpsters, you know, making sure you didn't throw out anything come spring cleaning. No, that you want to hand on out for us and uh, go shopping there today. Rat Sass, how you doing? And Erathian, welcome to Spaced Out Radio's chat room. We appreciate it. David Hayworth, thank you for coming on in. As we continue on with our roll call, do me a favor, everybody. Hi, Lex Tan. Throw those horns up. Let's rock. of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on odyssey radio talk stream live at kpnl all of our archives are free you can join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old Davey the favor hit that subscribe button you can follow us on twitter at spaced out radio instagram at spaced out radio show and on patreon in the space travelers club our website once again spacedoutradio.com and what else can i tell you Yes, this tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. A power show of awesomeness tonight as we go into a direction we rarely go into. Demonic possession is where we're going. Author Ron Felber will be here to break it on down momentarily. Then in hour number three, we have Steve Stockton from Among the Missing. Robin Haynes is here with the Cryptid Report. It's Dave 101 night, and right after that, the weird news of the week. Let's head right to it, shall we? And Ron Felber is a graduate of Georgetown University, Loyola University, and Drew University, where he earned his doctorate. He began his career writing stories for True Detective magazine and the iconic Nick Carter series while working as a deputy sheriff transporting federal prisoners. Well, let's look at what he is doing today. His most recent book is The Unwelcome, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. It's based on a true medical case history story passed along to him by William Peter Blatty, the author of The Exorcist. Ron Boxed Golden Gloves holds a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and was CEO of a major manufacturing company for more than a decade. And now he just writes stories living in his beautiful home in Florida. Ron Felber. It's always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio. And I'm not even kissing your butt here when I say you are one of my top 10 favorite guests of all time on this show. Always a pleasure to be on your show. And, you know, it's just uh, so re relaxed and such a great atmosphere, you know? Well, you know, we try and have fun around here while we talk about these topics. And, you know, one of the things that, Ron, that we don't hear a lot of stories of these days is demonic possession. And we're going to get into that momentarily but you have written about everything man you have written about ufos you have written fiction stories you have written all sorts of of strange type of stories that people just adore what do you like better do you like better writing fiction where you get to use your imagination and really put a movie together in people's heads with your words or do you prefer the true stories that are out there and the curious cases that really make us shiver. 
Yeah. You know, since uh, maybe Truman Capote uh, did In Cold Blood or Norman Mailer did Executioner's Song, um, there's a, a, an art form that's uh, called narrative fiction. And narrative fiction is where you take a true story, but you write it in a, in a format like a novel. So, for example, The Unwelcomed, I started out writing a documentary, you know, just say, OK, let's do a straight documentary. But really, it started to read like a medical case book. And I wasn't trying to write a medical case book. I wanted to, 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 to have the reader understand the terror that, uh, that this woman underwent and the, the presence of evil incarnate. And you can, you can do that with um, uh, you know, medical terms, et cetera, and I use them. But more, more than that, thanks to Bill Blatty, who wrote The Exorcist, he, he passed this story along and directed me to the Harvard Medical School Library where the records were kept. And in those records were the letters passed between the doctor and his patient and the team of doctors, the medical transcripts from hypnotic sessions. And so they were so dramatic. I, I put them together in a way that reads like a novel. And really my favorite is, is, is sort of uh, something between where you have a true story and you, for example, almost all of the dialogue comes from transcripts between the doctor and the patient, et cetera. But it's incredibly dramatic to begin with, but I try to set the mood, I try to set the stage and, um, and, and have it read like a novel in the sense that it moves forward and has a very dramatic pace. That's my favorite. Writing is such a, is such a, a style. You know, like my former writing and journalism is so much different than yours. And, you know, trying to paint a picture for, for instance, Ron, when I was working in radio, I had to make sure I painted a picture in 40 second spurts. Yeah. Okay. And try and get as much information in there as possible. You have time to decorate what, what I like to call decorate mm -hmm. and really paint a picture for the audience. How difficult is that? Because I have tried it. I still have a book that I'm working on for the last seven years of my own experiences that I never seem to get to because I always run out of time or find more yeah. fun things to do. Yeah. But, yeah. but how do you do it? How do you gain control of your mind to sit down and put your fingers to the keyboard? Well, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I went to a, uh, a high school run by uh, Benedictine monks. And these were some pretty tough characters, I have to tell you. This was in the central ward of Newark, New Jersey. And um, it was, it, if, the, if they taught you nothing else, they taught you discipline and good study habits. And so I think a lot of it has to do with self-discipline. And the other, which um, you ask about setting and whatnot, I teach writing at, uh, to graduate students at Drew University in, in Madison, New Jersey. And uh, one of the things I tell them, which was a great help to me, was it's sort of like sitting next to somebody at a bar. Instead of looking at this as some formal exercise, pretend you're sitting next to somebody at a bar and you say, you know, you're not going to believe what happened to me yesterday. Or do you know, I just read this story at the medical, at the Harvard Medical School Library. Let me tell you how incredible this story is. And if you keep that voice, this, that kind of um, uh, conversational voice, the story comes across a lot more authentic and it, it's much easier to write than sitting there stiffly with a pen or a, you know, a, a word processor and, and trying, to, trying to make things perfect. It's the story that counts. It's, you know, Bill Blatty told me this and it was uh, who, who, you know, we became very good friends over the years. And he said, he said, in ancient times, primitives would sit around a, a campfire and they'd have the different various people and their, what they did in the tribe, but there was a storyteller. And the storyteller would tell a story that was interesting, that meant something to the people and that taught them something. And nothing's changed. That's exactly what writers do today. You know, they tell a story that that is relevant to the audience. They tell a story that um, is entertaining. And if you're very lucky, they tell a story that, that has some influence on your life. I want to ask you about that because, 
you know, in today's world with, with so much technology, you know, writing is, is, is almost a lost art here in 2024. Mm -hmm. And yet there's more books than ever that have been put out. People just don't buy books anymore and, and they've lost their passion for what a good book can do. I'm somebody, Ron, who I grew up in a family. I never saw my parents reading mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. And it wasn't until I met my and started dating my ex-wife where, you know, she was addicted to reading and she got me addicted to reading. Mm -hmm. And I found the, the real passion because all of a sudden I wasn't reading. I was watching a movie yes. being played in my head. And I and I blame Tom Clancy for that in his Jack <laughs> Ryan, in his Jack Ryan series. Yes, that. Uh, but, but you know, you say it exactly right, because basically it should be like a movie playing in your head. It should be pictures, and you know, it should be a story unraveling and unfolding in front of your eyes as you're reading. But one thing that that I found, and I, I've talked to people. You know, just general people, guys, you know, uh, that I know, friends and that I meet. And a lot of people have turned back to reading because the world is so noisy and the world is so chaotic. And you're bombarded with commercials and you're bombarded with, uh, you know, info commercials. You're bombarded with uh, news, you know, 24-7. And there's nothing so relaxing, so private and personal as reading a great book. I mean, it's the well, most relaxing thing in the world. And, and and if you're lucky, you learn something, you know? And it's healthy for your mind. It's good exercise. Oh, yeah. We've forgotten about that. That is for sure. In your opinion, what makes a great story? When you are scouring the world wondering what to write on next, Rod, what makes a good story? What does it you have know, to have? I've been incredibly lucky. And, you know, maybe it's uh, destiny. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think so. But stories have come to me i mean people know that i'm a writer so uh occasionally and this has happened for example with mojave incident a fellow that uh, worked for me when i was running a company he was a salesman in california i was on the east coast in new jersey we became friends and so when i was out on the west coast we'd have dinner and he told me about uh, this couple that had been that he he played football an all-league football player that he he was his best friend and he told me this story and it became the Mojave incident. Um, as far as the hunt for Kunsa, the world's uh, uh, foremost uh, heroin dealer, 70% of the supplied 70% of the heroin in the world. This is a fellow in Burma. I was at a Christmas party. A uh, guy who was uh, working for the DEA was a guest at the party. He knew I was a writer and said, you know, there's this guy in Burma it's controls 70 percent of the heroin market so i said uh, would you take me there he goes what do you mean i said i'll go with you to burma and that's how the hunt for kunsa happened um and as far as the unwelcomed uh bill blatty uh, i got to know him while he was filming the exorcist at georgetown i was a student kid i had a a novel that uh you know typos all over the place a big sheaf of yellow paper you know running around saying, would you read my 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 book? And uh, I didn't get to meet him, but I met his admin while they were filming. And uh, reluctantly, she promised to pass it along to him, which she did. I went back from school to uh, New Jersey for my um, uh, Thanksgiving vacation. I got a phone call from Bill Blatty. He said, I like your story. Uh, why don't you come to the Marriott Key Bridge and uh, you know, we'll have a drink and talk about it. He didn't help me publish that, but he said, I have a great story I was going to write, but I'm, I'm going in a different direction, but I'll give it to you. And this was the unwelcome. So you see, a lot of times these things fall in your lap because people know you're a writer, you know, and, and also it's luck. I mean, I've been very lucky, but also if a person was at a Christmas party and a DEA guy said, well, there's this fellow in Burma. I don't know how many people would say I'll hop on a plane and go to Burma with you. So it's a combination of those two things. Wow. I mean, the interesting part about being a writer is that you absolutely get to choose your own adventure. Yes. And I remember being in elementary school and, you know, when I, we'd go to the library, the choose your own adventures were always my favorite books to read as a kid. Mm -hmm. That being said, when you're choosing your adventure, 
because you're all over the map with what you write about, whether it's true crime, whether it's fiction, whether it's UFOs and now demonic possession, mm -hmm. you know, are you just writing on what's piquing your interest at that time? Uh, I always look at a story and, you know, there's a, an argument that goes on among uh, the literati, which is like, do you write for the audience or do you write for yourself and the audience finds you or do you find the audience? And um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Dave, what I look at is would a million people be interested in this story? So if somebody comes up to me on you know, they're an upholsterer or something and say, you know, I have a corruption story about the upholstery business that's going to blow the lid off things. I say, well, how many people are interested in the upholstery business? No offense to, to people in the upholstery industry, but it's just not the kind of story that, that's going to have um, traction. And so I right. look for something that, that has real audience appeal and that I can be passionate about enough to spend two years with it and still be excited at the end of the two years. Is that how long it takes you? It's about two years to... Yeah. This to particular write. book took more than 50 years. I tried to write it when, when Blatty uh, passed the story along back in 73 or so. And actually, I, I flew out to California from uh, Washington, D.C., where, was, where, was where I was a deputy sheriff. I flew out to California with the manuscript and it, it I wrote it again, a, a straight documentary and it just, it just didn't gel. It's very difficult to write about something that happened 120 years ago, you know, and Sigmund Freud is a character. And William James, the famous abnormal psychiatrist from Harvard was a character and Clara was a character and a detective was a character. How did people talk then? You know, what, what cigarettes did they smoke? What uh, boots did they wear? How prevalent were cars, you know, in 1898 in, um, in Boston? And so you really have to research a lot and really have to put your mind in that time. And uh, as a young writer, I wasn't able to do that. I just didn't have the talent. But about three years ago, I said, you know, let me take another crack at this. And, uh, and this time it worked out just fine. That's awesome. What did you know about demonic possession before you wrote this book? Um, really, I, I guess the exorcist, but I'll tell you where I really came to understand demonic possession was transporting federal prisoners. And the reason is uh, I, I had transported or met and interviewed people that killed 80 people, you know, for example, uh, people that had you know just done horrendous things that I, I won't even go into. Um, and it occurred to me after three years of doing that and meeting a handful of people, just a handful, that um, demonic possession is a lot more real than most people think. You know, we can get into the spiritual side of good and evil, but let's put that aside. Yes. I truly believe that at some point in time, if you talk about a Jack the Ripper, or if you talk about an H.H. H. Holmes, if you talk about some of the people I met, whose names you'll never know, they literally surrender their souls and become evil incarnate. They like hurting things. They like killing things. They like destroying hope. And these are basically the the... the personages that that prowl the earth and uh are the devil incarnate that's that's my opinion okay so as you study this i don't i don't are you a religious guy are you somebody who who is uh, grown up you know good versus evil devil versus god or or what have you um i i guess i you know i mean uh, when i was a kid we went to church uh, on sundays but not every sunday it was raised in a, a Catholic uh, family. But um, now to be to be honest, I you know, I'm not a church goer these days, and I'm not an overly religious person. But I do understand all, all, to a large extent, just through physics, just through uh, reading about uh, quantum mechanics and things like that, that, you know, we know absolutely nothing about uh, what reality is. As a matter of fact, uh, Sir Francis Crick, who who was the, the founder, the co-founder of DNA and won the Nobel Prize for Science in 58, 1958, 
said the chances of us understanding what is real is zero. Mm -hmm. Meaning we have no idea what's real. Our brain screens out much of reality. And so we pretty much see what we want to see. And if we really saw the world as it is, it would be, uh, it would be mind blowing. <laughs> it, it totally would. I mean, for you to take on a historic case like this, and we're going to get into that more in the next half hour. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious, you know, what goes through your mind? Because I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that going into a story like this, you're, you're going into some very dark areas that you might just not be comfortable with or any person would be comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had people, you know, when you're writing a book, you have people that help you proofread district typos and things like that. I had a woman that read the book and, uh, and said, you know what? I haven't slept for three nights. You know, she was very disturbed by the whole prospect. Um, from my standpoint, um, I think, I think that people invite evil into their lives by one shape or form they invite it in. And I suppose the, uh, the, uh, the best way to fight, um, the devil is acts of kindness. I was expecting more than just that shorter answer there. Yeah, I think I think at the end, um, uh, if you're asking, did I have nightmares? Was I, 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 I didn't have nightmares because I mean I'm I'm not uh, as I say a, a very religious guy, but I'm a spiritual guy, and um, and uh, I'd like to think I'm a good guy, and so I I think that protects you from these things. I think I think that demonic possession is something you invite into your life. And really, my, my, my book is really, in the end, a, a testimony to, to uh, faith, faith in a creator. I guess it does come down to that. You know, did, do you think writing a story like this makes you question your own spirituality and your own guidelines that you follow? Oh, sure. I think so, because... Um, if, if anything, you know, there's such a thing as 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 uh, infection, demonic infections, where where the priest or the the doctor that's involved um, actually uh, becomes possessed themselves. And as a matter of fact, in Loudon, in uh, France, at a, a convent, there's a famous story that Aldous Aldous Huxley um, documented, the Devils of Loudon, where I think it was four priests were sent to stem an epidemic of demonic possession at a, at a nunnery, at a convent. And uh, all four wound up in terrible situations and were possessed themselves. Three of them died within a year, and one of them went to a lunatic asylum where he spent the last 25 years of his life. So it's something that can suck you into it if, you know, if, um, if you're vulnerable, I guess. Would you consider yourself vulnerable? Um, I guess everybody's vulnerable, but I, I think I think there's a line. And as I say, these people, the people that I talked about, the the serial killers, etc. I think there's a line that you consciously have to step across. Yeah. I'm curious. With 30 seconds to go, what's that line? Uh, what is that line? I think it's uh, it's surrendering your soul for um, for money, for power, for the pleasure of something like killing. If that's what uh, you know, that I think I think that. Yeah. Right on, Ron. I'm going to get you to hold on right there sure. because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Author Ron Felber has a brand new book out called. The Unwelcome, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler, all about demonic possession, found on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Great one to add to your library. We will be right back on Spaced Out Radio right after this.
All right, we are clear, my friend. So now we're talking, the two of us. Yeah, and our YouTube and podcast audience can hear us. Good. Okay, great. All right. There we go. Philip Baca, how you doing? Seriously, in our chat room tonight, it's not even a full moon yet. And the, and the, <laughs> and the lunatics are out. <laughs> I've had, I've already had to, I never time anybody out. I rarely ban people uh, in the chat room. Like you really got to piss me off to, to get banned uh, from this channel. Yeah, you seem but like a pretty easy going guy. I, I have already had to, to uh, time out two people already. Hellion Beast, how you doing? It's like, <laughs> where's my trifecta? Who's going to be number three tonight? <laughs> Man. Man. I, 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 you know what, Ron, I, um, I run a real, uh, and my audience, 99.9% .9 of them actually appreciate it, but I, I run uh, my chat room like a, uh, it's not a democracy in my chat room. I call it a Davocracy. Uh -huh, and, there you go. And, um, uh, I make sure that like, I don't care what your religion is, what your political party is, what your color is, or what your sexuality is. When you come into my chat room, you come in and have fun. You yes. know what I'm saying? And you yes. enjoy the night. And um, it's just one of those things where uh, every now and again, uh, some people who need therapy uh, sneak in. Well, you know, I hope I'm not being too serious here. I just oh uh, no, you, you asked a serious question. I you know I'm going to give you serious answers. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's not, it's not a topic you know where you're uh, you know hoisting red balloons in the air and uh, oh, dancing. very true. Yeah, so. very, very true. Al Gray on Twitch, how you doing? And Alien Believers, nice to see you back. Me Woiken, good to have you back. Kurt M, nice to see you. Uh, Clifford Murphy, you're going to smarten up now, correct? Uh, let's make sure. Otherwise, uh, you're going to get a 10 minute misconduct. <laughs> I put everything in hockey terms. So that's the beautiful part about it. All right. We are, we are about halfway through here, Ron. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's a very interesting parallel it, it suggests about uh, UFOs and alien abduction and demonic possession. Oh, I know. In, in looking at these two stories. It's remarkable the number of coincidences that you know that that crisscross between them. Oh, very much so, very and, much. So. And that's something people are talking about now. I, I hadn't heard that much of that until maybe the last couple of years, but that that's uh, a topic that comes up quite often. You know, are, are aliens? What do aliens have to do with a demonic possession or demons? Are they demons? What you know? What's this? Are they interdimensional beings? You know. It's a different conversation than it was five years ago. Oh, I would totally agree with that. And you know, the more and more that we uh, that we start to blend the phenomena together mm -hmm. as one, I think we're going to see more of that. I really do. I agree. I agree. I, I think you um, know, because mm -hmm. the more the more people I talk to, and the more experiences I've had. Uh, it really is something that um, that I'm seeing a real blend in everything. That it's all one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I mean, if there's anything I've come to, and I'm just a book uh, called "The Case Against Reality" that I just finished reading recently, and uh, he may, he makes a, a case that maybe we can talk about a little bit later, but that uh, that most physicists are coming to the conclusion that that evolution, for example, doesn't really account for, for the development, let's say, of a human brain, you know, and that, and that, that there is a spiritual element to existence, you know? Absolutely. I totally which, agree with which, you. Which, which materialists, going back to Prince's time, really devoutly denied. You know, there was a battle between spiritualists and scientists going on at the time. Prince was in one camp, and Richard Hoxson, uh, who was a, a uh, the president of the um, Society for Psychical Researchers uh, in Massachusetts, was part of the team, and they battled 
uh, as to what was going on with Clara Fowler. Wow. Give me two seconds here, Ron, because we're coming back in about 25 seconds. Thank you so much to both Simon and Joe for kicking off the Super Chats tonight. Very much appreciate the uh, no political comments in our chat rooms. Bobbert, you know better than that. Uh, wrenches, let's uh, tighten it up in the room, please. And, uh, yeah, now I forgot what I was going to say. So thank you, people. Here we go. go with the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate broadcasting to you live. I want to remind all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Author Ron Felber is here. He's got a brand new book out that can be found on Amazon and Barnes and Noble The Unwelcomed, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. It is about demonic possession. It is one that you would definitely want to add to your library. Ron, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to be here. Well, let's start to get into some details about this. Sure. Demonic possession. You're learning about it. You're writing about it. Who is this young lady named Clara Fowler? Yeah. You know, uh, this takes place at the turn of the century, the, the 20th century. So it's 1898 to 1904 is the time period in uh, Back Bay, Boston, Beacon Hill, Boston. Um she was a student at Radcliffe College uh, in her 20s, early 20s, 22 years old. And uh, she went to a Dr. Putnam, uh, who was, again, one of the Boston Brahmin. These were all sort of high society, Harvard graduates, etc. So she wound up there suffering from what they called at the time neurasthenia. And neurasthenia was sort of a term they used for someone that was completely fatigued, run down, insomnia, you couldn't sleep, uh, poor appetite, uh, lack of concentration, and, um, and just run down neurasthenia. Well, she went to Putnam with that, those, those um, symptoms, but then she started talking about horrible nightmares. And in her regular state, the, the Clara Fowler that came in, who was a quiet, studious kind of woman, very religious, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Prince, who wound up being her physician, referred to her as the saint because she had had visitations from Jesus Christ and from uh, the Virgin Mary. And, you know, she's very adamant about spatial time, you know, where she saw them, what they said, the conversations they'd have, and very religious. And that's the way she lived. Then all of a sudden she starts having these horrible nightmares. She... Um, wakes up in the morning and there's her clothes are shredded her money is ripped up there may be a threatening letter that says you know when are you going to put a bullet through your head this body is mine and um so she she lives in fear of the nightmares so she doesn't sleep when she tries to eat she sees you know insects in her food maggots in her food so she, she can't eat and um she has these nightmares of robed figures, uh, being surrounded by robed figures, demons, uh, gremlin type demons uh, on the posts of her bed. She tormented. So Putnam, who's a basically a general practitioner, says, you know, this is out of my league. But William James, the famous William James, is really the father of abnormal psychiatry and was the first to teach it in America at Harvard Medical School. And uh, Dr. Morton Prince, who was also one of the founders of behavioralism uh, in, in terms of psychiatry, he turned it over to them and said, you know, this is 
a strange case. And if I didn't know better, this wasn't uh, the turn of the century, I'd say she's suffering from demonic possession. And uh, she would talk in a, a, vo a bass voice totally unlike her own. Her face would remold. She would go get incredibly violent about anything religious. Any priest came in the room or if, uh, there was a religious uh, 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 figure of, of some kind, rosary beads, things like would just she would she would go crazy, very violent. Um, and so they studied her and they formed a team. And this is what makes the book interesting and the story interesting, I think, because you have Morton Prince, who was a rival of Sigmund Freud and wanted uh, to push his version of, of psychiatry, not psychoanalysis, which was Freud, but behavioralism, meaning the reason people behave this way is a chemical imbalance in the brain, for example, you know, that it has a physical root. It doesn't have to do with sexual fantasies and all that. He thought that was just garbage. He thought that there were there were um, physical elements in the brain that were sometimes defective or off in some way that would create epilepsy or would create schizophrenia, et cetera. So he was really pushing that position. But because these symptoms were so um, so much pointing to demonic possession, he brought into the fold uh, Richard Hoxson, Dr. Richard Hoxson, who was a spiritualist and uh, was a psychic researcher. And so the team was composed of Prince, Dr. Prince, William James, the famous William James, um, Leonora Piper, who was a clairvoyant, Richard Hoxson, who was a spiritualist and a psychic researcher, and George Waterman, who was a Harvard graduate uh, and, and Prince's protege. And that was the team that was formed. Putting a powerhouse team of Ivy League scholars along with spiritualists together seems like an odd combination to try and bring down the devil. Yeah. You see, at the time, there were something like 9 million spiritualists uh, in the United States and Europe. And they included people like Madame Curie, who you know uh, uh, pretty much invented x-rays included uh, the physicist uh, Lodge, uh, Sir Edward Lodge, included Charles Dickens, included Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Sherlock Holmes writer. So there were a lot of heavyweights, intellectuals that believed in, in seances and believed in, in the ability of certain people to uh, contact the spirit world and the dead. And Prince wanted to wanted to have a consensus so that when he wrote his book or presented his paper at the Paris uh, uh, conference, which is every couple of years he would attend and wanted to give a, a lecture on this and make it and really overshadow Freud. That's really what he wanted to do. He, he needed to have that base covered. If he just took it from his point of view at the time, people would just say, well, that's what you want to, you know, that's what you, the direction you want to, to see this through. But if he had a, a team and they, they argued, I mean, there was a debate going on constantly between the two. And of course, um, even though Prince prevailed because he was the one that wrote a book about it, Dissociation of a Personality, uh, William James believed it was uh, demonic possession or some form of uh, uh, the paranormal. And Hogson was convinced that, uh, that it was demonic possession. So, so it made for, a, a very thorough study and a broad base when, which was necessary at the time. Basing what they had seen, how did they know that this was demonic possession? Was it because of the time or maybe the, the young lady Clara was, was just somebody who was mentally incapable of living, maybe insane. Yeah. Um, well, the, the thing of it is in, in, in the original personality, the second second personality the second consciousness the demonic presence it, she was a student she was a very bright capable student she was maybe um, more religious than most certainly more religious than most saintly even but this was a you know it was a pretty stable character and and so and so when she starts talking in languages that she has no knowledge of 
in a voice that's clearly a man's voice that is explosive. When the things she says are just laden with hatred, when her face really remolds and, uh, and looks like a different person, tremendous strength. In the demonic state, she had no pain, no felt no pain, had no need of food, no need of sleep, never ill. And they studied for, for six years. So this was not some you know minor study. And that's what makes this so interesting. It isn't just a, a flash, you know, a, a flash shot of something. It was a prolonged study where they, they got to perform a lot of tests in both states, even to the point where they retrogressed the demonic state back to its origin, hell. When did Clara first learn that she was possessed? Uh, actually, she had missing time, so she didn't really know she was possessed. But as things turned out, the, the demonic presence realized that the weaker she was, the easier it was for it to take over the body and maintain control. And so it would, uh, it would have her walking miles and miles, wake up lost, not knowing where she was, to fatigue her, to let her not sleep, let her not eat. And it was convinced that it was spirit and didn't need the body was like um, no no more than the clothes you wear you know that body means nothing to me you want to you want to hurt the body as a matter of fact the, the demonic presence she would wake up with lacerations on her back claw marks on her back bathed in alcohol for example so she was tormented and tortured so it she, this 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 uh presence truly believed that it would survive while she was rotting in a corp in a uh, in a wooden box, you know. Oh and it God. talks about it, you know. So it, it, it's it was a strange, strange case, at, at least, and uh, certainly uh, one that Prince sort of sanitized because, believe it or not, Clara Fowler wound up marrying one of the doctors, his protege, George Waterman, Doctor George Waterman and becoming a prominent socialite in Boston after she was cured. And so the records that Prince kept, even in the Harvard Medical School, the name was crossed out, you know, so you couldn't read it, the names, uh, that name in particular, uh, because he wanted to protect uh, her privacy because she wound up being a, a, a socialite and the wife of uh, one of the prominent uh, physicians in Boston at the time. Really? Okay. When did she first start noticing that something wasn't right? I think, I think probably the nightmares, the content of the nightmares, where I, I said surrounded by robed figures, yes. um, processions of robed figures that she was walking amongst. Um, if she went to a church, which she did and stopped going, you couldn't read a Bible. You know, couldn't read a Bible, couldn't concentrate. Uh, she'd have uh, like visions of uh, of um, the the priest or the, the minister, or whatever, who's giving a sermon, may become Satan. And uh, so, so her whole life was really turned upside down. So, in the one state, she became a very tragic figure. You know, frail, run down, neurasthenic, and on the other. She was robust and uh, violent and hateful and uh, and uh, actually um, actually without giving too much away um, had the strength of ten men and uh, was a murderess. Oh, nice had lady! No, no memory of it, no notion that it had happened. And the detective, the city marshal that from Fall River, who pursued her thinking that the father was the murderer. I and mean, what do you do with somebody that has no memory of, uh, of ever doing these things and winds up being cured with no memory of, that any of this happened? Right. I mean, that's hard for a lot of us to fathom that somebody going through that doesn't have any recall whatsoever. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's kind to of scary. Totally, to totally way. distinct 
consciousness. Totally distinct. Hmm. And 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 again, the one consciousness despises the other. This you know, like like loathes the other, wants to kill her. Now, back then, psychiatry wasn't in the state of knowledge as it is today. You know, were they truly convinced this was demonic, or could it have been something else? Yeah, sure, it could have been something else. And and Prince, you know, of course, drives that home. He called it dissociation. And his theory, and it plays out to some extent, his theory was that uh, she had undergone a trauma, or more than one trauma, where it fractured her. And, and her normal personality fractured into like a Jekyll Hyde, good and evil personages. And, um, and that basically dissociation is a kind of historical state where you go through something that's so, mm, so uh, difficult to accept trauma, so difficult to accept that you reject it. And like a mirror, your personality shatters. And in the case of a religious person, it shatters into a good person and an evil person. And so that was the dissociative state that uh, he argued for. Hmm. And what's Ron Felber's opinion of that? I think this is the, along with Blatty, that, uh, that this is the most studied and... Um, convincing case of demonic possession that, um, that that's around. I mean, that, that, that has been so closely looked at, so closely documented. So I think that, uh, as I mentioned in the first half hour, I believe that at some point in time, uh, people can be possessed by a demonic presence. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, I, and, I, and I'm sorry for keeping saying wow here, but this is just, to me, an amazing an amazing story that, that is going on. Now, Now back then in the 1800s, when, when this happened, there were a lot of, as you said, educated people that were paying attention to this and this young lady being possessed. Was she a religious type of person? Did she go to church like the majority of people w yes. did? back then yeah she was uh, i would even say more than religious she she might have been morbidly religious you know very religious to the point where again she talked about visitations from the virgin mary visitations from jesus christ so she was you know very religious um i, I do want to make a distinction this was the late 1800s so you're talking really 1900 or so you're talking the turn of the century and um and uh, you had some of the, you had Sigmund Freud, who uh, was familiar with this case. But by and large, there was no publicity. This, this, this was right. a hush-hush situation. Because again, you have um, a, a college student from, uh, from Radcliffe. You have uh, ultimately a marriage between the doctor and the uh, a, a socialite and, and the woman. So it was really suppressed. Mm -hmm. It was suppressed, certainly at the time. Prince wrote a book, a medical case history, called Dissociation of a Personality in 1906 that uh, documents much of this. But uh, and, and much of my research comes from there. But currently, if you were to look up this case, and he called her uh, Christine Beauchamp in the, in the book, disguised her name, it was a pseudonym, um, you would see that the medical establishment now would talk about not the demon as as William James referred to her or or Prince, but Sally. And Sally was a mischievous kind of personality, you know, uh, uh, rebellious, etc. But that isn't the case at all. That's an incredibly sanitized version of this story. The real story is much darker, much deeper and much more relevant than than what you, what a student would see now in a medical textbook 
uh, with regard to this case. Now, how old was she when this happened? How old? Oh, she was 22. Yeah. So here she is, obviously a college student, yep. trying to find her way in the world. And not many women back then went to college. Right. So it would have been a rarity for her Very and, and, and women's rights back then. It would have been a giant step towards towards a, a large, fu a big future, a bright future for her. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and this happens. Did she have any, I know you said she didn't have any recall of what happened, right. but did she have any clues or give any clues on how this began or how it happened? Well, the doctors, uh, it almost became a detective story because uh, Prince's whole thesis was that uh, this was the result of hysteria caused by a catastrophic trauma. So what was the catastrophic trauma? And, uh, you know, they get to uh, some pretty horrific stuff that happened in her childhood and, um, and later in life. But uh, primarily in her childhood, her two siblings, uh, her two siblings, died and uh and were murdered and so uh, that certainly was one trauma and then um she she had a uh, she was sexually accosted uh while working at a hospital so there were there were traumas in her life two major ones and those would be the two major ones um and again i don't want to give away too much of the story except to say that that there were traumas but it seems almost like like some of the people that that wind up uh, being possessed demonic possession have a kind of personality collapse there, there's a vacuum and that vacuum gets filled and um you know whether the, the entrance is like through a ouija board which some people say or maybe just uh a uh, a passion for for evil um that vacuum gets filled and there's a sort of an entrance way in and sometimes sometimes uh it's a trauma it, you know it's a, it's a catastrophic trauma where the personality collapses and something else uh comes in something else possesses it the person and there's a lot of stories you know you you, you would think this is rare but it isn't nearly as rare as you would think uh there are a lot of um exorcisms in the United States and, and all around the world. As a matter of fact, um, I think it maybe was just not so many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the Vatican started retraining priests and has a team of exorcists. Right now, I think there's about 150 Catholic exorcists in the United States when there were only a handful, maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And actually, there's a staff now run by the Vatican of exorcists worldwide. And um, it isn't just the Catholic Church. Demonic possession is something that uh, the Jewish faith uh, recognizes, and certainly uh, Baptists and uh, the Protestant uh, uh, faith also recognizes. So it's not so rare as you might think. I, I won't take a stab at how many exorcists are performed in the United States every year, but it's a lot more than you would think. Because you just don't hear about them anymore, Ron. I mean, it's the the pop it, topic of demonic possession really seems to have uh, got, left the mainstream, if if that's a correct term I could use. If you um, if you go on uh, YouTube, for example, there's a uh, some Catholic exorcists that uh, that they uh, uh, interview, and they describe things that that it, that that they've uh, encountered. And as I say. Um, the number of exorcists has expanded tremendously, at least within the Catholic Church, and I think probably, um, probably in other religions as well. And and really, at the end, it's when psychiatrists just become exhausted. They, they, there's no really. We don't know what's wrong with this person. We don't know how to treat this person. And on that note, Ron, we are through hour number one, hour number two, with Ron Felber coming up right after this. The unwelcome, the curious case of Clara Fowler is on sale on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Your questions and more on demonic possession on Spaced Out Radio after this. This 
is Spaced Out Radio with hosts Dave Scott. All right, Ron, we are clear, and I'm just going to uh, take a quick break here. I'm going to put you back in the green room, and I'll be right back, okay? And I'll do the same. So we're talking a couple minutes? Yeah, we got about five minutes here. Fine. See you tomorrow. All right. I'll be right back, people. Be right back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We got a great show coming.
All right, I am back. So is Ron. Lee the Bee, how you doing? And let's bring Ron in here. It's flying on by, man. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ozzy, Ozzy, nice to see you. And where else? I think that's about it. All right. If you have any questions, uh, put them in capital letters, if you don't mind. That way they're easier for me to find. And I will ask Ron the questions. Look at that. Lip blade sharpened. Our audience is loving your mustache, Ron. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Paisley Parker, how you doing? And thank you tonight to Puck Elf, Picks, Simon Times 2, and Cosmic Joe for the super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. And don't forget, you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. Nothing ugly there, so go <laughs> shopping today. Here we go with hour number two. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, TalkStream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Oblation. Oblation is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. We continue on tonight with Ron Felber. He is the author of The Unwelcome, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. It can be found on Amazon and Barnes and Noble as well. Ron, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. My pleasure. What did you learn through all this experience of delving into this case of Clara Fowler? What did you learn about demonic possession yeah i think um i think what i've learned is something i mentioned before i think we know very little about what reality is and you know you had uh, like sir isaac newton you know apple drops from the tree you have gravity etc and there are things that you observe but now with quantum mechanics and uh, exploring the, the huge number, the huge number of universes that are out there, it, you, I, you you tend to look at things and say, there's just much more to reality than we are aware of, and I have to come up with the conclusion that there is a spiritual world, that there is you want to call it interdimensional, be my guest, but there are other um, existences that that are i think intimately involved in human existence and uh if you want to call them angels if you want to call them devils that's fine but at the end i do believe that there's a struggle that goes on uh beyond be, be for the for the the souls of human beings between good and evil i think there are two forces at work that battle within each of us and they're external as well I, I believe that. That's what I've come to. Considering that in today's day and age, the a, a good large portion of the Western population has lost their their religious side of God, devil, Jesus, everything along those lines, and has really turned more to an agnostic or spiritual type of attitude that people have. Do you think that we've forgotten? 
that there is a darker side to life itself? Well, I mean, when you look at a Ted Bundy or, you know, some of these characters, these serial killers, the Iceman, et cetera, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, you don't want to see it. At the end, uh, the playwright Baudelaire said, the greatest trick the devil ever played was convincing people he doesn't exist. And I think uh, to a large degree, that's what's happened. We've replaced spirituality with technology, but even the, the, the greatest scientists these days understand that technology only takes you so far. You know, something as simple as light, we, we don't really understand light and we don't see light. We see a version of light, but we don't see uh, ultraviolet rays. We don't see infrared rays. We don't see radio waves. We don't see microwaves. So what we see is a very thin slice of reality. And I, I think the, the bulk of reality is way outside of our, our vision and our purview. So that, that's where I've come to in all of this. Man, you mentioned the Iceman, Richard Kuklinski. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That man was to be one of the faces of evil because he, he had such split personality, his family side, and then his mobster as a hitman side. Mm -hmm. You know, I've watched that Iceman documentary probably two dozen times. Yeah. And I, and I still can't get enough of that one. But, but let me ask you in watching it, do you come away saying that evil exists? Yes, but, but 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 there there's a difference between that though because in my and please correct me if oh. I'm reading this wrong, okay? Oh. To me, there's a difference between something like Richard Kuklinski who did it as a job, okay, and mm -hmm. and took out mobsters rather than someone who is like Ted Bundy or Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper or Richard Ramirez or other mm -hmm. serial killers who did it for pleasure. Yes, I, I, I would agree. I know I have no argument there, but do you know, you would mention, I just, funny thing. I just looked up uh, something on the internet. It said that actually exorcisms have been on the rise for the last 10 years or so. And that 60, 60%, though fewer people go to church, 60% of Americans still believe that there's a devil and that there's a hell. It's just not polite conversation. Well, it, I think it's one of those one of those taboo conversations that you don't have anymore, Ron. Well, you know? I mean, that, that along with about twenty five other topics, right? Absolutely, and we we could easily list those off. I mean, yeah. it's not you know, it's not as easy as the old uh, uh, adage where you never ask a woman her age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just But you see, the, the danger in that really is that if you don't talk about something like the, the existence of evil, because that's the topic of our, of our conversation, if you don't or can't talk about that, what are you doing? You're just ignoring something you know exists. And what happens when you ignore a problem? It just gets bigger. It just gets more difficult to confront later. And um, I think that that in a large, so if you look, look at the world. I mean, uh, I think, I think that a unifying force, whatever you want to call it, is godlike, a unifying force. I think the devil loves chaos, loves destruction, loves death, and loves showing human beings to be, and this is a quote from the book, the brutish animals I know them to be. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So going along those lines, you know, getting back to the Clara Fowler case. Yes. Did the, you know, without giving away too much in the book, what was the devil or this demon speaking through her? What, what was the story that was happening? Um, you know, to a large extent, um, how much he hated her, how much, uh, how much he despised what the things she did, religious things, uh, that the body was his, not hers, and, and uh, that he believed he could take it over if she was dead and still survive. The, the body 
they performed tests, as I mentioned. This consciousness was awake 24 seven, knew her dreams, knew her weaknesses, knew everything that she was afraid of, for example. So she was ill, as I mentioned, with these nightmares and things. And so, uh, and so she was friendly with her landlady and a, a couple of uh, students and um, they knew she was ill. So she comes back into her um, room, opens the door and she sees a, a package and it's wrapped nicely with a ribbon and whatnot. And she thinks, oh, maybe the landlady, it's a gift, a get well gift or something. She opens it and in the box are, is a dead rat and spiders, you know, a nest of spiders. And this is the kind of thing that she would deal with continuously, you know, just pranks, but not just pranks, things like where, where she was driven to the point where she was uh, driven to the end of her rope, where they thought she'd die from malnutrition. Wow. Wow. I, she I have be. a letter. I'll tell you what. Here's a letter that uh, that that she found along with uh, her clothes being destroyed and her money being destroyed. September 14th, 1898. Hypocrite, whore, how I hate you. The pains of hell shall come down upon thee. You shall find no help, no comfort in heaven or earth from my wrath. Not till student Clara is dead and puts a bullet through her head. Devil, devil, devil. Well, that's pleasant. Yeah, well, you know, that's what she lived with. And fortunately, she was cured. And they actually had an exorcism. And the, the interesting thing is, as I mentioned, Prince was, was, you know, Prince believed, and he wasn't a blockhead, you know, where he just had one direction. He believed that paranormal things exist, that the human brain, we didn't know enough about it, and we still don't, as, as to what the capabilities of the human brain might be. And so she had clairvoyance. She showed clairvoyance where she would predict what, what was going to happen to him or something that was going to happen. And he would say, well, it's not supernatural. It's an element of the human brain or capacity that, that we really don't understand yet. So he would chalk almost everything up to a physical imbalance in the, you know, a chemical imbalance or a hormonal imbalance or a capacity uh, uh, for perception, extra perception, but that it was all natural. Even though some of these things seemed, you know, crazy supernatural, I mean, crazy paranormal, you know, he, he would, would come back to that line. Well, we don't understand it, but it's, it's, it's a natural phenomenon. Of course, the, the other side of that argument which was Hogson, Richard Hogson, was saying, no, look, we've got a woman that has all the classic signs of demonic possession. She hates things that are religious. She wants to take over the body. She wants to torment this woman because she's a saint. Um, she feels no pain. She talks in languages that she has no business knowing, you know, no way to know Latin, Greek, Aramaic. She uh, has incredible strength. Yeah, you know, you ignore all of these things. And his argument was, if it was one thing like telekinesis, like where a chair is rattling, that kind of thing. If it was one thing like her face distorts, okay. Mm -hmm. But for all of these things to happen to one individual at the same time, it, it makes no sense. It, this is what it appears to be, demonic possession. Another entity, a spiritual entity entering the body of this woman. That was the, 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 the pro and con arguments. I get that. Okay. So looking towards the topic, because I, I do want to start getting some uh, audience questions in sure. here uh, in just a couple of seconds here. But looking towards this case once again to kind of wrap things up you said she was able to get healed through exorcism and prayer and and many other types of of uh healing processes was she able to live a normal life after that yeah one let me just make a distinction so hogson had this exorcism and said this is because there's a demon and the exorcism will exorcise this demon prince 
did it because he thought the he thought that she believed she was possessed. Therefore, an exorcism, the shock value of an exorcism would cure her potentially. So there were the exorcism was done from two different points of view. At the end, she had tremendous uh, it's like a detective story in many ways. But in the end, um, she was cured. And in the end, as I mentioned, she wound up marrying uh, Dr. George Waterman and uh, living not just a normal life, but the life of a, a wealthy socialite with no, no memory whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, as I said, all the records were disguised. The names were, her name was taken out of everything. A book that he published gave her a pseudonym and left out many of the details that I was able to uncover through the transcripts and whatnot at the Harvard Medical School Library. So she did live a normal life, even more than a normal life. She, you know, she lived, I think, into her 80s. Wow. Wow. With no side effects. No, not, 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 none that uh, were written about anyway. I mean, there must be some fear that goes on with that, Ron, where you're afraid that that spirit or that demon can come back at any time to relaunch that. Yeah, I, I, I would think. And, you know, even, uh, of course, we did the story um, on alien abduction, the uh, Mojave incident, and that was the constant fear that uh, the, the couple lived with. And I'm sure that was the same. I don't think those things go away even though she had no memory of it, you know, the doctor, she was married to one of the doctors. So I'm sure that, you know, that ultimately she knew what, what happened to her. She might not remember it, but she knew what happened to her. Hmm. Yeah. It's a harrowing story. You know, it's, it's really a spooky um, story mm -hmm. because it's real. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm just shocked because I could never imagine what it would be like to go through that. I yeah. mean, we all go through dark times. Okay. I've been through dark times and, and I remember, I, I always said, I, I looked at, you know, my, my saying to myself was I looked the devil in the eye and I won. I told yeah. him to where to go and how to get there. And, and I won. Yeah. Right. And that was during the gloomiest of gloomy times. And, and, have... and, and, and maybe you did look the devil in the eye. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Maybe these things aren't just metaphors, you know. Maybe they're more real than you think. You know, but I could never imagine what it would be like to ha lose control of your body right. and be possessed. Right. Absolutely. Before we bring the audience questions in, what did you learn personally about exorcisms and the power of an exorcist? Um, I think I think that, uh, as I say, I'm just reading a book called Doors of Perception, Aldous Huxley. He says the human brain is constructed through evolution to, to let you survive. So you know how to get water, you know how to get food, you know how to get money, you know how to procreate. That's basically, you know, the box that you're in. And the brain is fu function is to screen out, is to screen out what is real and just limit the purview to, to what you have. So what I've learned and what I've come away with is, again, I think we know very little about what's real. I think that uh, the more you look at uh, these telescopes and whatnot, that, you know, even a a pinpoint look at the universe shows billions of universes, you know, billions of universes. It, it makes me realize that, um, that, that there is a creator, that there is a spiritual world that exists interdimensional, if you want to call it interdimensional, I'm fine with that. But that, that what we see is a small part of reality, a very small part of reality. Ron, let's get to some audience questions as we have about four minutes to go here before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. And 
First question is from Pix, who is asking, who the flaming hell is the devil anyways? I mean, what is his provenance? The binary good versus evil construct seems severely wanting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, I have a line or two. Can I read it? Yeah, Where please the devil do. actually talks about that. Bear with me. Here. You know, why do I bother with a pathetic blank like Clara Fowler? I do it because it's my job. God is dead. Jesus is in hell. Moment to moment, we fight for the souls of humans, sometimes by the thousands, often one at a time. Each a small or momentous victory, and we celebrate those victories. Truly, we do. So then uh, one of the characters, this uh, Leonora Piper, mentions God. Incompetent, blithering. Angels have lost confidence in him, knowing the power of the forces I command. I think the English would say he let his side down. Another secret. Most are borderline, but occasionally we come upon a special case. Borden, Lizzie Borden, Holmes, the Ripper, countless others whose names you'll never know. And these, by their own choosing, become me, evil incarnate, prowling the world, the earth, with one purpose, to reduce God's so-called creations to the brutish animals I know them to be. Uh, I think I think it's a contest. I think that we're in a kind of, like the Greeks, you know, the Greeks looked at gods in Mount Olympus with a sort of a, and also on a sort of a board. And I think, I think that's true. I think that we're a kind of experiment, whether we're an extraterrestrial experiment, which I think we are, you know, um, I think that there's a contest going on and, uh, you know, whether it's about flaming hell, I'm not so sure. I think maybe it's about hope or lack of hope. All right, I think we got time for for one more question here. Let me just get to it to see uh, what we can sneak in here. And let's go to President Zaddy. Since we can't tell what is reality, are people that are abducted demonically possessed when they get abducted because they are inviting the abduction? Um, I don't know. The only thing I can tell you is that having written and studied, I mean, you know, for years, really, like the Mojave incident, you know, you're talking maybe three, four years of study on the subject, and I would say this longer than that on this. I would say the parallels between alien abduction and uh, demonic possession are many. The one I really noticed is the, the Hesses talked about this sulfur smell, like potassium, this heavy industrial kind of sulfur smell well that's the same thing that clara fowler talked about you know was this 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 sulfur smell in both cases in the cases of uh, the hesses and the alien abduction story the mojave incident they had these dwarfish sort of dwarfish sort of gremlin figures that were a lot like the demonic figures that that clara fowler talked about that loomed over her bed in both cases, you had um, uh, Clara Fowler being reassured by the Virgin Mary. In the case of the Hesses, when all when they thought they were in hell and in hell, that's what they thought, and dying, you know, from a heart attack, they were going to die from heart attacks. An angelic presence, clearly feminine, came. They called it their comforter and calmed them down. Said, you know, you, your children will be okay. They're not going to be injured. You'll make it through this. Just have faith. And so those are pretty strong parallels. Uh, how, how they relate is something I haven't figured out yet, but they're related. On that note, Ron, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are sure. going to go break at the bottom of the hour. We have author Ron Felber for another 30 minutes here on Space Dog Radio. Stay tuned. Listening to Space Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. And there we go, Ron. We are clear. Clear as a whistle. 
Good questions so far, guys. Uh, I believe I got enough questions for the next half hour, everybody. So um, if I need any, I'll ask you guys. Yeah, we got a few. We got a few. Always fun when you're here, Ron. Yeah, same. I, you know, I like I said, I, I hate to be so serious, but you know, it's a kind of serious topic, and um, it's difficult to to make light of it too much, you know. True. Yeah. Very true. And and you know, really, what you're talking about is your life and my life. You know, why are we here? What are we doing? You know, they're they're pretty heavy philosophical questions when you come down to it. Definitely a lot of philosophy going on there. Yeah, that's true. We, I think we'd rather be talking about hockey. How about that? I will talk hockey anytime. With you. <laughs> I figured you might. <laughs> I'm a boxing fan. I love boxing. I used to box, so uh, so it's something you follow. It tends to be whatever you played, let's say in high school or so, is pretty much what you follow in terms Are of you school. Are you following the Mike Tyson versus yeah, Jake? Yeah, sure. yeah, I am. I don't Tyson. know. You Tyson. can ask me about devils and angels, but don't ask me about that because I don't know. <laughs> Tyson is gonna is gonna uh, is gonna just destroy him. See the the issue. I like I said. I I really study boxing. The thing of it is, Mike Tyson is not as great as people think. He had three or four great years, but. Evander Hollifield, who was a cruiserweight, beat him twice. You know, Lennox Lewis took him apart. So the thing with Mike Tyson is he's dangerous for four rounds, maybe five. And then he, he, he loses his steam. And if a good boxer can tire him out, get beyond five or six rounds, Tyson loses his steam and gets sloppy. And that's when a good boxer can pick him apart, which is what Buster Douglas did and in yeah. Hollifield and, and Lennox Lewis. So the question is, can this guy, who's not a bad boxer, by the way, he's not a bad boxer. He's, he's like professional, you know, mid-rung professional. But he's bigger. He's younger by I don't know how many years, uh, 27, 37, 47, 50, by 30 years. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if you're asking me what will happen, Tyson will knock him out in two rounds. But you never know. If the guy can hang on, he's got longer arms, he's taller. If he can survive, you know, he, he could knock Tyson out. Well, it's going to be interesting. That's, I always thought Vander Holyfield was a boring boxer, man. Yeah, yeah. He was boring. He never had that that amazing I, – I guess maybe it was because coming off of Tyson where – you expected the 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 boxing match to last two rounds, if that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And the power of his punches. Yeah. But I mean, to me, Holyfield was just boring. Yeah. Everything you know, about him was boring. You know what? That's like Tyson is like Jack Dempsey. You know who that is from the 1920s? Jack Dempsey. Yes. Yeah. That's Tyson's favorite fighter because they fight alike. And Gene Tunney, who was a lot like Holyfield beat Jack Dempsey twice, but nobody remembers that. And so they ask, who's the greatest fighter of that era? Oh, it was Jack Dempsey. But he lost twice to to a, a not very big ex-Marine named Gene Tunney. But he but Gene Tunney was a boring fighter. So who do you mm -hmm. remember? You remember Mike Tyson and you remember Jack Dempsey, you know? Yep. I oh I agree. I People agree. People like knockouts. Yeah, they like knockouts. Yeah. And, and I, I think you know, boxing to me is a lost art because yeah. it just became a shady promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but it is, a, it is a beautiful sport. It really is. Well, when you see two really good uh, fighters, you know, let's say a Roberto Duran or a Manny Pacquiao, or I love Mayweather. Pacquiao. Yeah, I love Pacquiao too. What a gentleman too. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I met Ricky Hatton. A number of years ago, actually, I was at my pre-divorce party in Vegas, pre and, <laughs> and right right after his fight with Manny Pacquiao, oh, he got murdered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hatton walked into the private nightclub I was in, mm -hmm. and uh, surrounded by all his guys and everything. But just a nice guy, very nice yeah. guy. 
you know, almost every boxer I've I've ever met, and I met you know quite a few of them. They're they're really gentle people. They're really yep. gentle people. Very unlike what you'd expect. Uh, not oh, yeah. not the stereotype. A guy like um, Lennox Lewis is a yep. great guy. I was with my kids and met him, and you know, he's just a, just a gentleman. You know. One second, we're going to get going here in five seconds. Thank you to Puck Elf, Pick Simon's Time, Sue and Joe. Here we go with the f next half hour. Here comes the second half of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. I always appreciate her your listening ears. Reminder all of you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, <clears throat> spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read the news wire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Final time, we say hello to our guest, Ron Felber, who is the author of a new book called The Unwelcome, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. It is about demonic possession. It can be found on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, a great one to add to your library. Ron, welcome back. Good to see you, Dave. All right. We're going to continue with some audience questions here, starting off with Mr. NHI. Ron, what is wrong with the non-human intelligence, big black eyes? Is that demonic in your opinion? Could be. Could be. You know, I, I have a quote from Norman Mailer that you might get a kick out of. And just, just try this on for size. And Norman Mailer is a, you know one of the great minds of the 20th century. And here's what he had to say about, about this. He said, and it relates, the devil might be a presence from another universe. We might be fighting an implacable enemy out there, and the devil might be the agent of the implacable enemy with God as the tired general fighting that war with his own agents of hope. So, I mean, he sees things as, a, as again, this, this huge canvas that, that we're sort of played out in the middle of between things and uh, whether these big black eyed uh, uh, aliens are demonic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's uh, quite possible. All right, let's continue on. Let's go to Pol Pot. How can you tell the difference between demonic possession and mm -hmm. schizophrenia? Yeah. Um, that that's uh, interesting because uh, if you take schizophrenia or you take um, dissociation of these things, you might have uh, violence. You might have um, different thought patterns where somebody is, uh, you know, very bombastic on one one moment and then very depressed the next. So you might have um, a kind of bipolar situation, and you might have uh, violence. What we don't have is clairvoyance, you know, where, where people predict what's going to happen or read the minds of the people in front of them. You don't have um, uh, superhuman strength necessarily, although it could could happen. You don't have um, uh, speaking languages that they couldn't possibly know, Greek, Latin, Aramaic. You don't have... Um, Uh, voices where you know where they're literally their face changes their voice becomes a man's voice clearly a man's voice explosive um it's it, it it's the difference between something that that is odd but explainable and something that goes beyond odd and explainable where a, a reasonable doctor physician scientist would say I, I don't know what this is I can't explain it so I think I think I think it it it, it enters a realm that's uh, that's impossible to explain through science. Okay, let's continue on. Let's go to Simon in Australia who is asking Ron, 
who dry cleans your shirts and what's their number? You're looking good tonight. <laughs> well, it's a new shirt. So there you are. <laughs> so there's my secret. I gave it away. All right. It's a new shirt. All right. All right. Let's go to Tony here. Have you personally seen levitation? No, no, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't really been involved. I've never been involved in an exorcism um, or, or anything like that. But I did, ha I did have an experience that maybe you'd be interested in that has to do with um, UFOs. Yeah, I, let's I, I think we've sort of decided that, that these things are somewhat related. So when I was doing interviews on the Mojave incident, people would often ask, I mean, have you ever had a alien abduction experience or seen a UFO? And I would say no. But the, the more I thought about it, the more I said, well, you know, to myself, I had a dream one time, maybe 30 years ago. I was living by the beach in New Jersey, and it was winter. And in the dream, I, I would walk my dog early in the morning, four in the morning, because I had to take flights and, and, and travel. And in the dream, I came upon a pond, which was really there, you know, and I was walking my dog, which I did regularly. And in the dream, I stopped and I saw this UFO at the bottom of this pond, maybe 30 feet down or so. It was freezing cold. And the last thing anyone would think about doing is diving in the water. But in the dream, I was felt compelled to do that. So I left the dog and I dove in the water and I wound up inside this craft. And these beings escorted me around, showed me maps, explained things. I had questions. It was very cordial. And soon after, I found myself in the dream with the dog leash in my hand, my watch, which had stopped, started up again. And I said, well, that's a very vivid dream. And, uh, and it stuck with me. For years. Then I came upon the Hesses and the Mojave incident in a very coincidental situation where a friend of a friend of a friend, you know, talked them into meeting me and talked me into meeting them. So a, a huge coincidence. Then about four months ago, I had my a second surgery on my knee. And uh, the doctor came out with an x-ray and on the x-ray was like a silver arrow head, just the size of maybe your pinky, the nail on your pinky, an arrow head, silver on the x-ray. He said, you know, I, I went in and did what I had to do to your meniscus or whatever. He said, but I, I found this piece of metal there and I couldn't get it out. I fished around, but I, I didn't want to do any damage to your knee, but I fished around and tried to get it out. But finally, I just left it in there because I couldn't get it out. So I said, well, you know, is it going to get infected? He said, well, it's been in there for years. It's probably not. I guess you're okay. I just wanted you to know that. So I said, all right. Didn't think too much of it. About three months ago, I'm watching a show on alien abduction. And uh, what does this guy bring out who claims he was abducted? But an x-ray. And the x-ray has almost exactly what was in my knee was in his knee. And they, they did a magnetic test on it in the show. They said there were some radio waves or something that they, they discerned came out of it. And I said, you know, that's a lot of coincidences. So one of the doctors that, was, uh, that gave me a, a read of uh, the unwelcomed and provided an endorsement for it from a medical standpoint, um, I talked to him. I said, you do re retrogressive hypnosis, right? He goes, oh, yeah, sure. That's a part of my practice. So in May, he's going to retrogress me back to the dream and see if there's more to it than meets the eye. And, wow. uh, and so isn't that, isn't that a, an odd little story? Well, I'm glad to hear you got some aliens. That's so, for sure. So I've never seen anything of uh, anybody levitate, but... Who knows? Maybe I'll have an alien abduction story to tell you about next time. <laughs> well, that would be wonderful. That would be <laughs> completely wonderful. Let's continue with some audience questions. Let's go to slow motion here. How can you tell the difference between possession and multi-personality disorder? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's pretty much the same answer. I think that in multiple personalities, you'll have somebody that's uh, very studious, and then somebody that's very reckless. You'll have somebody that's uh, 
you know, maybe, maybe occasionally that's uh, psychotic, you know, or violent and whatnot, but, uh, but it, it isn't about, it's about separate lives. It isn't about one hating the host, wanting to kill the host, claiming to be spirit, you know, claiming to be the devil, you know, so th there's a quite, a, quite a difference. One is a, a fracturing of the personalities and usually they're fragments of personalities, not full blown personalities. You know, they'll have, they'll have, they'll be like phantoms, phantom personalities, not completely developed. And that would be multiple personality. This, this is something quite different in that, um, in that the second personality despises the first claims to be a spirit, not a corporal being and, um, and displays, uh, contempt and disgust at, and anything that has to do with uh, God or religion. So it's different. Paul wants to know what year did the Clara Fowler case take place? Yeah, it was 1898 when she walked into uh, Prince's office and uh, 1904 when uh, she was pronounced cured. Hellion Beast would like to know, did the entity ever make its name known? Yes. I'm, I'm not going to be pronouncing it too well, but it's a Bagdon, I think. And um, and uh, it turned out to be um, the, the demonic presence that was worshipped in a cult in Fall River at the time. No kidding. Yeah. All right. I, I think it's a great question by Tony here. Ron, are you personally scared of attachments after writing a book like this? You know, I, I, I talked to a priest about this. And uh, just to show you how, I don't know. Anyway, I'll just tell you. Before he would discuss this, he, he said we have to pray and protect ourselves before we start discussing this in any great detail. So... You know, there are certainly cases uh, of attachments. So that's a good word. And um, and uh, no, I, I I guess, is it something I've thought about? Yes, it's something I've thought about. Is it something that keeps me awake at night? No, no, it isn't. Have you ever had an attachment? No, no, I haven't. I, I really, um, I, I believe that these things ultimately are choices. And I think that for a, a, a demonic presence, I think you have to let it in. I, th I don't think, I don't think it, it can attack a person that is repugnant, is repulsed by, uh, by it. I have had an attachment. Tell me. They are not, they are not fun. Tell, tell me about that. I'm interested. I, you know, I have had, well, I do a ghost tour. Mm -hmm. And I actually had one that was really angry with me at, at one point until I brought him some beer <laughs> and, and we talked it out. He didn't like my ghost tour. And one night before our, a ghost tour, this is going back, I think to 2018. Um, it, I shouldn't say it. The attachment came off of me and went to my partner and she woke up and there was a dark hand right above her face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, it was going to go for her throat and it never did. Thank goodness. But it's just one of those things where it just, um, it was, it was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. overall. Mm -hmm. It kind of freaked her out. Yeah. And I'm sure. So uh, I have seen it happen. I've also, uh, uh, been uh, cursed at one point before I started the radio show. I had a who I thought was a friend of mine. She mm. was a witch. Uh, she actually cursed me, and I had to get the curse removed. And, and how did you know you were cursed? Lots of depression, lots of anxiety, uh -huh. uh, always, always feeling uh, sore, always feeling down. Yeah, uh, like you know, people with the black cloud over. Yeah. Um, I was hurt by the loss of the friendship mm -hmm. and so was my partner and, uh, 
her ex fiance actually was the one who told me that she had cursed me and she had cursed me because she was very narcissistic. And when I was learning about my own personal experiences, she wanted the limelight in the friends group and yet everything was happening to me. And she did it out of jealousy to try and mm -hmm. get it to stop on me and to ruin what I had going. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean, even in your life experience and in mine, I mean, you can talk about these things and acknowledge them or you can ignore them and pretend they don't exist, but you're just kind of pretending they don't exist because deep down, you know, they exist, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We got a couple more audience questions here. Sure. This one from president, uh, president Zaddy. Do you think Ron, there is a link between alien abductions and demonic possessions? Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned, I mean, I, I just think that um, it, particularly from my standpoint, because I did a book on alien abductions and knew these people, you know, I, I was with them for three years. I had, them, I had them retrogressed. I had them brought to the National Center of Psychiatry to be evaluated. So, I mean, I basically live with these people in, in a sense. And certainly they share, you know, intimacies that, uh, you know, that, that you acknowledge and, and learn from. And with this other story, the Clara Fowler story, I, I studied this case and other cases, of course, and, and got became very familiar with with the, uh, the, the the things that are entailed in both phenomena. And uh, as I mentioned, the smell of sulfur comes up all the time in both. The uh, idea of an of a demonic and an angelic presence, a comforter in the one case, the alien abduction story. And the Virgin Mary, who could easily be, you know, if you're a religious person and you see an entity that's comforting, that's beautiful, etc., you say that's the Virgin Mary. If you're not a religious person, you say, oh, it was a comforter. It was this feminine force that looked, you know, angelic. See what I mean? It depends on what the lens that you look at it through. But in both cases, whether they're religious or not, they, they have this personage that is a kind of comforter and staves off, ultimately staves off the, the lesser life forms, whether they be the gremlin type alien beings or whether they be the demonic presence. But that entity, that comforter exists. And, um, you know, those are just, just some of the... Uh, some of the things, the angelic presence, the, the gremlin type uh, demonic figures that, that uh, the Hesse saw with red eyes, etc., the smell, and more than anything, the sense of, of um, levels, levels of uh, power. And the, the biggest power, the greatest power is the gentle power of the comforter as opposed to the chaos of the gremlins, the chaos and the malevolence and the frenzy, the scientific beings that studied them. And, um, and yeah, so, so there are definitely parallels and, and exactly how that works. I think the only thing that I can say is it has to do with interdimensional, interdimensional travel or interdimensional beings that, that show themselves not often, but that show themselves occasionally. All right, let's continue on here, Ron, as we've got about five and a half minutes. Let's go to Wu Riders. Have you heard of the seven generals of hell? And can you explain what you think their purpose is, if you have? I, I don't. I'm sorry. That's all right. NHI wants to know, what's your view on ancient relics? What is my view on ancient relics? Um... I think they can tell us a lot about the past. And uh, as we talked about, I think, I think that, uh, that these days, technology has replaced religion. And so basically anything that has a spiritual context to it seems like superstition and old fashioned. But in the end, these relics tell a story of beliefs that I think probably are coming back 
because the more I read about, again, quantum mechanics, the more I read about um, uh, discoveries uh, of other universes, etc., the more I come to think that uh, that there is a spiritual world that uh, that even scientists, many, particularly physicists, come to the conclusion that they hit a dead end. You know, the unmoved mover, the, the, the creator. Sir Francis Crick had such an interesting story. This is the guy that, that um, found, uh, founded, co-founder of DNA. He said that, that the odds of evolution creating the human brain, you know, from a swamp over time, there's not enough time for that to have happened. He said for that to be true would be like a tornado going through a junkyard, leaving behind a 757 jet, that took off and flew to Europe. That's how unlikely it is. His theory in a book called Life is that uh, extraterrestrials sent DNA in asteroids and meteors all around the universe. And that in some places like Earth, it passed through the Van Halen belt and radiation activated the DNA. The DNA then began evolution with a huge head start which makes us kind of extraterrestrials. We've got about three minutes to go here tonight. Granted, this is a true story, the unwelcome, the curse, mm -hmm. or pardon me, the curious case of Clara Fowler. Right. Looking at all the notes and everything that you gathered through everything, what did you learn and what would be your message to the audience who is going to go out and purchase this book what was the, what did you learn about the devil possession and yourself through all of this yeah you know the uh, without giving too much away again there's this uh, city marshal who was hell bent on um on finding the the killer of these uh clara siblings and um and prince who who has written this book and uh, and it, which actually became a Broadway play in 1912, and called the case of Becky, I think. In any case, uh, they're walking apart the last time they meet, and uh, and the detective decides to drop charges, and so Prince says, "Well, why did you do that?" He said, "I found it like disturbing what the demon said." about, you know, the forces that he was unleashing, the way that he was corrupting humankind, leading to World War I. And uh, I found out how to defeat the devil. And Prince says, how? And he goes, acts of kindness. That's what I found out. The way to defeat evil is acts of kindness. That always seems to work, doesn't it? It yeah. just seems to make sense that way. One minute to go here, Ron, and you have so many good books out there and you have so many good teachings. What's up next for you? Well, I think I'm going to uh, see what happens with this retrogressive uh, uh, hypnosis that I'm going to go through. And if, if it's nothing, well, it's nothing. But if it turns out to be that 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 dream was real and that there was an abduction and that in my knee is this tracking device. I will have that tracking device removed. I'll have surgery, get the tracking device removed and uh, I'll write a new book and it will be called truth. Well, when do you plan on having that done? I have a day. I think it's May 18th or something like that. Yeah. I'm going to go to Tampa, Florida and spend a weekend uh, with this, this, uh, a psychiatrist, medical doctor. All right. Ron Felber, it is always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio. You know you got a free ticket to come by here anytime you feel like it. A lot just, of fun there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron Felber, everybody. And don't forget, you can get all of his books on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Coming up next, Among the Missing with Steve Stockton and Robin Haynes will be here for the Cryptid Report. A lot more show on Spaced Out Radio coming at you right after this. Stay tuned. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with your host, Dave Scott. Yeah. 
Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Very much. Appreciate you, my friend. It was always a lot of fun. Always a pleasure, bud. You take I care. Take, you take care too. Bye bye. Talk again, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. All right, there we go. All right, I'll be right back, everybody. Stay tuned. More show to come.
right. Sorry about that. Had to take a call from Merle. Merle. Thurston Howell the third. How are you, my man? Good to see you. Thank you tonight to T-Bone Times 2 and Simon Times 2, Cosmic Joe, Pix, and Puck Elf for the super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. And uh, don't forget, everyone, you can shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. We do not have ugly swag, people. Nothing ugly there. Yep. Hold on. Yeah, what a great show with Ron. Don't forget, you can get his books on Amazon or on Barnes & Noble online. They're great reads, everybody. Great, great reads. So check it on out. And here we go with the next half hour. Here we go with the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. So excited to be broadcasting to you live here on the big show where we wear a lot of tin for Reminder that we got great programming each and every night here on the Mighty SOR. And we want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Oblation. Oblation is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. Here we go. Steve Stockton from Among the Missing has another spooky story. Hello, friends. Welcome to Among the Missing YouTube channel on Spaced Out Radio. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'm about to take you on an unbelievable journey of people just like you. Their stories and encounters will haunt us on Among the Missing. There have been some tragedies at the extinct volcano ever since its discovery back in 1864. It was during that year that Kendall Van Hook Bumpus was guiding a newspaperman through the area when he broke the topsoil of a geothermal mud pot, scalding his leg so bad it would eventually need to be amputated. Since then, the area has become a national park and measures have been taken to maintain safety for visitors. However, there have still been some tragic events at the park. 2009, the Botell family were in the park sightseeing with their children, one of which was nine-year-old Tommy Botell Jr. Tommy and his sister sat on a retaining wall near the trail the family was hiking on when the wall gave way and toppled over. The parents rushed to grab their children, but Tommy was crushed by the falling stone. Mommy, I can't see, was the last words Tommy Botell Jr. uttered to his mother before he passed away. Now, it's said that the Park Service superintendent knew about the deteriorating wall, but it failed to fix it, and even went so far as to cover up the mistake after the tragic death. The family sued, however, and reached a settlement agreement a few years later after the accident. Then, in October of 2012, two hikers in the Bumpus Hill area were missing for six days. Search and rescue teams were deployed to find the missing pair, but were unable to locate them. An update on the Lassen Park website, Facebook, stated the hikers were found after having spent an additional five days missing. No injuries were reported. However, there wasn't much information on the missing duo. In 2016, Park Service closed Bumpus Hill Hiking Trail after two hikers fell and broke some bones and were airlifted from the area. Another hiker broke their wrist the following day, prompting the park to issue an announcement of closure due to slippery conditions on the hiking trail caused by ice and snow. This was in July. Before they could close the park, though, several more people injured themselves due to inclement weather. In October of 2017, 
The Park Service closed the Bumpus Trail and made several repairs and improvements to the one-and-a-half-mile hiking trail between the parking area and the basin. The section reopened in September of 2019, with other parts of the park closing for maintenance improvements. So, know before you go. Even though Bumpus Hill is in California, there's still sometimes snow present in the summer months due to the amounts they get during the winter. Anyone wishing to hike the trail needs to take adequate clothing for the weather and the terrain. This could mean even crampons and hiking poles in July and use of a jacket and snow pants. The Park Service suggests the best time to go to the hike Bumpus Hill is late July to August or September. And thank you to Steve Stockton from Among the Missing for another creepy story. Never want to go missing in a forest or somewhere like that. No, otherwise you'll end up on Steve Stockton's show Among the Missing on YouTube. Go hit subscribe and ring that bell. From the missing to the mysterious, here comes Robin Haynes and the Cryptid Report. <laughs> Robin Haynes is here as we are about a month away from actually getting to meet Robin down in Nebraska at the Bigfoot Conference. I'm very much looking forward to that. How are you doing, Robin? I am doing great, and I'm so excited to see you. I Nebraska know. Bigfoot Conference 26-27, sponsored by Spadies, Jerry Spady Chevrolet. GMC out of Hastings, Nebraska, and we are just, we are so excited. It's getting bigger every day. I Lots know. Of going into it. We still have to talk because I need, I need a flight down there. I know. I need like some inf pertinent information for you before I can book you. So I pertinent. will like message you maybe tomorrow. <laughs> okay. I pertinent promise information. You, even, even if I have to hitchhike. I will be there. I may have to show some leg on the highways down. No, but I'm sure you're I'll good. Get... You are good. I got your flight covered, babe. I just got to have some serious information from you so I can book it. <laughs> of course. Of course. I have an interesting story for you that I wanted to, to pass your way. Okay. I met with a gentleman about three weeks ago. I had a gentleman come into my daytime office and he's like, hey, are you the guy who goes looking for Bigfoot in the forest? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And he goes, good. Do you mind if I share a story with you? And I'm like, sure. I love a good Bigfoot story. And anyways, this happened in December, 2022. It was a cold winter night or day, pardon me, but he still goes out to walk around, you know, for his daily walk on, on the road, even though there's snow and ice out there, he doesn't care. He's going out there. It's part of living up here, you know, and long story short, he's walking past his neighbor's house and right on the edge of the road, he sees 12 giant tracks. Oh, wow. They're all about, you know, five, six feet apart. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And at first he thought maybe it was a moose who did it. And then, you know, moose have pretty big feet or a bear has pretty big feet. And then maybe the snow melted around it to expand the track. Because when right. the snow starts to melt, even the smallest of deer tracks can look like a, a, a big, big track mm -hmm. after a little while. But this Absolutely. wasn't. Right. You know, he never took any photos. He never, you know, he, his dog was running all around. And anyways, he what he did do was he looked for the beginning and the ending of the tracks. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how that creature got there. There were no tracks across the road or in the farmer's field or in his field or in the ditch, nothing. And when they ended, they just seemed to stop. Yeah. And they no tracks going once again into his neighbor's yard or onto the road path or anywhere into the ditch, anywhere could not find anything. And he was talking to his neighbor about it. And he said, Hey, did, did you hear or see anything strange in the, in the last little bit here? And his neighbor said, no, no, not really. He goes, however, 
in the in the woods over there and he pointed to the woods where they had a little pond or creek or something like that he goes i did hear a big bang and crash of the ice breaking and he goes that kind of startled his dog because the reason why he was outside was he was taking his dog out to go to the bathroom and that's when he heard this big bang and crash the dog starts barking and and everything along with that so could it have been that creature, whatever it was? I mean, it could have been anything. It could have been a, a bear that was late for hibernation. It could have been a moose that, uh, you know, big, heavy moose at yeah. 15, 2,000 pounds that broke through the ice. Or it could have been our friendly neighborhood Sasquatch. I don't know. Okay. But the footprints really, really affected him. And he'd been sitting quietly on that story for a long time and just felt it was time to actually talk about it. You and I have talked about footprints and the footsteps quite a bit, Robin. Yeah. Where do these prints just arrive and disappear? How does that happen? Well, that's when you hit the paranormal side of it. And since we're, of course, spaced out radio where we deal with the paranormal all the time, um, it's a better platform to talk about it on. I mean, there's several different things that could have happened. Number one, they do levitate. I've actually physically seen it. I know many people that have seen it and they do levitate. Two, even when they're cloaked, they will leave footprints, okay? Because they're bending the light so you can still see the body. But when they go from physical form, even while cloaked, they go into spirit form and then they're not gonna leave a footprint. The other option that you have is these are beings that are capable of opening and closing a portal at will. So if they are stepping out of a portal and they're going into that fresh snow or mud or dirt, whatever, and then they leave footprints, they can simply open them. You have all kinds of portals. You have anchored portals and you have, you know, free floating portal. And I've literally seen them literally open a rift and or a portal themselves wherever they're at and step into it. So could the, is it possible they can step out of one, you know, walk the 10, 12 feet or whatever they you choose to do and go into another one? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are actual explanations as to how they do this. A little bit hard to, to chew on. Yeah, because it is on the paranormal side, but it's actually possible. And I've seen them do most all of them. And so that's how they do it. They really and truly do. That's why you see every now and then you'll just see one track. You'll see one footprint, one random footprint and nothing anywhere else. And that's how. Like when they are in physical form and they cloak, they're bending the light around them. They raise the frequency, they raise the energy. And it's almost like the vibration is so fast that it bends that light around them. But they're still in, in a, a heavy physical form. You're just not able to see them. But when they go from that and they shift into spirit form, there is no physical body. Therefore, they would not leave a track. Wow. Okay. So with those 12 footprints, which is a rarity to actually see a track line. Yeah. Okay? Track Usually, lines are harder to find. Okay. How rare are track lines to find? I would say out of every 10 prints that you find, you might get one that's a track line. Some of your out of the way places, you're more likely to like up in the mountains or way, way, way out in the woods, you know, you're more likely to find them. Um, I used to find them when I was in Michigan on my property, every once in a while, we would find them because we were back in the woods, but we had a lot of sand base there too. So we would find track lines, but they're really not as easy to find as one would think that they are. It's more common to find, you know, one or two here or there. So I would say for every 10 that you find, maybe one would be a track line. Hmm. Okay. And it's rare to, to see multiple prints like that. I mean, yes. I've, heard, I've heard of people, I know one investigator down in Mission, British Columbia, he found a track line of over 60 prints in the mud. That's amazing. Yeah. And, but he's, he's also quite the flesh and blooder. Yeah, okay. I know. I found a track line in Michigan, and I went and I I cast put a made cast of every single footprint, and I had all the plaster in all of the footprints, and then took a picture of the track line that way, because it really stood out more, you know, because the plaster was in it, and you know that was helpful. But yeah, you don't find as many track lines, and you know you've got to have a good four or five steps to even consider it a track line. So that's fantastic. Yeah. 
Yeah, the most we found in our area is two, and they were both left footprints, and they were about 30 feet apart. There was no right footprints at all, but that doesn't surprise me. If I think logically about it, the ground was extremely dry, and yeah. we were going through a drought in that time. And so when you're in drought times, prints are obviously harder to create. Right. And that particular one could be putting more pressure on the one side of the foot. You know what I mean? One foot than the other. So it would not have made on the hard ground. It would not have made an impact on the other side. Okay. So what about the theory that a lot of first nations people have that they're walking in two different dimensions at the same time? You know, I, I'm going to tell you, I think it's very possible because these are a multi-dimensional being. They really and truly are. But that would coincide a lot with the, you know, whether they're going in and out of the portals and, you know, they're stepping out and then you see a little bit of a tracks and then they go back in again. So do I think it's possible? I actually really do. Knowing what I know about them, I would say it's very possible. And I think the First Nations people really have a good grasp on the abilities that these beings have. I think they do too. And I think it's something that we have to look at a lot more than what we actually do look at, look at in regards to these subjects. So my question then would, would follow up on this is if we don't find a true pattern, what does mm -hmm. that actually mean? What does it, does it mean that they aren't walking on two feet or in, in this dimension, does it, I, I know as crazy as that sounds, or does it, uh, does it mean that, that they're not putting enough pressure on one side or, uh, maybe I'm not explaining myself right, but I'm hoping I am for you. No, I don't think that means that at all. I think that it means that they are all individuals. Every situation is different at sometimes they are in two different dimensions. Sometimes they're levitating. Sometimes they're coming in and out of portals. I think we have to be open-minded enough to accept the fact that all of those things are possible. And they are all different individuals and each situation is different. It could be any one of those things. I mean, that's the reality of it. You know, that's the one thing that I have to give a lot of admiration and credit to with the First Nations. They seem to be much more willing to accept the paranormal side of them than a lot of our people do. And I think that we need to pay more attention to their thoughts on them because I think they've had for hundreds of years, they've had a much closer relationship with them than a lot of us have had. So I really feel like a lot of really great information can be learned from them. But I don't think it means anything other than whatever that particular Sasquatch individual is choosing to do at that time because there's such a wide array of situations that could cause it. Hmm. Okay. How come we don't find a lot of handprints? You know, they tend to be more on two legs than they do going down on, on, you know, two hands and two feet. I have found probably only about three or four of the handprints because they're primarily on two legs. I mean, they can get going and they'll bend down and they'll do like the crab crawl, you know, and that kind of thing. And then you might find them there, but they actually move more on two legs than they do going down on all fours. And I think that's why, you know, when they're upright, they've got a better visual of things. And I think they have more control of what they're doing than they do when they're on all fours. Hmm. Okay. But have handprints been found? Absolutely. I used to have a cast of them and I actually left them in Russia when I was in Russia. Um, and I, you know, got knuckle prints and stuff from when they've been down on all fours, but I, you know, they move very quickly when they go down on all fours, they really do. But I don't think they have as much control as on two legs because, you know, they are a human hybrid. So primarily they are on, on two feet and they move rather well like that when they're down on all fours, that limits their ability to use their hands as a defense tool or to be able to grab things to move quickly 
And it's, I just don't think in my own personal opinion that they are, while they're fast, I don't think they have the agility and the mobility to do it. And of course, when they're standing upright, the visuals for them are going to be much easier. So I think that's why we don't find them quite as prominently. Okay. What other, uh, have we ever had outside of maybe a face print on a window? Have we ever had any evidence of their face? I mean, there is the yeah. famous controvert, extremely controversial Todd standing photos, which to me do not look real. No, I agree. I agree. Um, and that's not a slam against Todd. I don't know the man and I don't go after people. I, I do. That's just not my style, but I think there's um, a lot more there than meets the eye. And I, I'm not going to say I wasn't there when he, he filmed them. So obviously I can't say, you know, with a hundred percent certainty that they're not legitimate. I personally take them with a grain of salt, but that's just myself. And I don't mean any disrespect to Todd or anybody else. It's just, I'm not getting what I feel like I need to out of those photos to like put my personal stamp on it. Not that it matters, but I just, I don't, um, I think we do get a lot of facial shots. I think people that habituate with them, such as myself, we're excessively protective. I have a extremely good facial, what I consider an extremely good facial photo of one of the youngsters here. Like you can see his lips, you can see the hair on his face, his eyelids, you know, his eyebrows, that kind of thing. But I think we're very protective. And in their people, they don't, you know, for the Sasquatch, their people believe that the camera lens deals are sold. The last thing they want is their their faces taken pictures of. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to get that. And people really, I used to years ago when um, Igor Borsev and I were doing a lot of research together. I was really into getting the photos and getting out because he wanted the evidence and he wanted the photos. And I've kind of gotten beyond that. You know, my experiences have been very, very in depth. And I do have a lot of photos and footage. And I just got past that where it's not comfortable for them. And I get more out of it with the experience than I do the photos. So I don't try as hard as I probably should or used to. But we don't get a lot of good facial photos. We really don't. They are very elusive in that manner. And there's only a few ways to get them. And most people don't realize that there are ways to get them. So we just don't get as many. You know, a lot of people get it where they've leaned their face on the windows, like you were saying, or, you know, on the car window or whatever. And you might get imprints that way. But we don't get a lot of really good clear ones. Like I said, I've got a few clear ones of faces. but. Not a lot. I would love to get a picture of a face. I'll send you a couple. I would I'll send really, you a couple. I, I actually I'm have make one by myself, you know? Yeah. I actually have one of a youngster with his hand over his face like this. He was up in the tree in my front yard and I went to go take his picture. And I really, and honestly, I was not aware he was up there. I mean, he's usually hanging out in the front yard anyway, but I wasn't aware of it. And I took the picture and you can see the hair coming down off his head. He had longer hair. And then you see all five fingers going like this over his face. Wow. So yeah, wow. I'll send it to you. It's, it's we, kind of a cool picture. We have 30 seconds left with you tonight on the abbreviated version of the cryptid report with Robin Haynes. Robin, do us a favor. Tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me at www.paranormal-empowerment.com or Robin Haynes, H-A-Y-N-E-S, on Facebook. That's what I love about you. And, of course, at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference oh, next definitely. month. That's going to be a lot of fun. Robin, thank We're you. We're going to have so much fun. And if you go June 8th to Spruce Pine in North Carolina, I will be speaking at the Alien UFO Expo and Conference. Love it. Coming up next, the Dave 101 and the Weird News of the Week. Stay tuned. The final half hour of Space Down Radio is Space Down Radio. And your host, Dave Scott. We'll talk to you later. Later, Robin. Take care. I will. And I will get hold of you my this weekend, my friend, for your info. Love it. Take care. Love you. Bye. Bye. Robin Haynes, everybody. <clears throat> so much fun with her. Her energy is awesome. Awesome, I tell you. 
Hi to the 175 people watching on YouTube and the 100 people watching on X. Menial scientists, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Big bad tets, how you doing? T-Bone, where you been lately, buddy? Meant to ask you that earlier. Yeah, Sovereign, I didn't have time, okay? A one-man show here, man. Didn't have time. Mm. Philippe Baca, what's happening? Philippe Baca nuts. Scrub a dub dubbers. What's happening? What kind of beer are you drinking, Scrub? Uh, Vanessa, hold on. I'll get that for you. Okay, here we go. I'm going to post the link right here. There you go. There's the link. Go grab it. Go grab it, Vanessa. I've never been to Nebraska. I am going to eat some corn there, though. Do we have any listeners in Nebraska? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't even know where Nebraska is. I got to look it up on a map here. Sorry, it's the Canadian in me. USA map. All right, let's go. Zoom in. Zoom in. Oh, there's Nebraska. So it's right below South Dakota and above Kansas. Wyoming to its left. Colorado to its southwest. Iowa, Missouri. Holy cow. It's uh, borders six, five, six different states. Eight three Oilers. That feels good. Nux beat Montreal four one tonight. Take that, no mashy, and known gnome Robbie. All right, big thank you to T-Bone times two, Puck Elf, Simon times two, Cosmic Joe, and Pix for the super chats. Very much appreciate the love and support. Really do. Also, if you're thinking about coming to Reno for the third annual SOR fan party, hit up info at spacedoutradio.com. Info at spacedoutradio.com. We need you there. Got a bunch of guests coming for you to hang out with you. So come hang out with us. 
and book your ticket today. All right, here we go, everybody. Final half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Always appreciate you tuning us on in. Reminder to all of you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on Patreon in the Space Travelers Club. It is that time of the night where it's time to take part in the Dave 101. But guess what? My audio is gone. It is not working. So we're just going to run it just like that. It is the Dave 101. I got to find that now. That actually kind of bugs me because I thought it was there. Wonder if I'm, no sweeper, no voice. Weird. Weird. Oh, well, we'll find it. We shall find it, I tell you. All right. My topic tonight is literally about the experiences people are having. Why do we tend to put those experiences down? I've been reading a lot of people on Twitter and Facebook recently about people who are very skeptical about what we are talking about. Now, there's no reason that we all shouldn't be a little bit skeptical about what we are dealing with with this phenomena. Of course, it is something that we need to pay attention to because not everything our eyes see are actually what it really is. And we have to be careful with that. You know, I'm fortunate with my own experiences where I've had a lot of witnesses with me who can cooperate in really helping me decipher what actually happened and what they experience as well. The majority of people, though, out there who do have the ultimate experience of seeing a ghost or being face-to-face with a Bigfoot or having a UFO come down and pick them up. They don't have that. It's all alone. It is something that they are very, very intrigued by the story, but it's very, very intimidating to try and explain. And the more that people come out and feel more comfortable about explaining their stories of the phenomena, the more they are getting attacked. The more people are coming out claiming that the science is right, the government is right, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick is right, Dr. Jeff Meldrum is right. Everybody that has a different approach to this subject seems to be right, and every experiencer seems to be wrong. Now, I don't get this type of thinking. They tend to call it critical thinking. They tend to call it that we must use objective thought and science to try and prove the existence of these creatures. Now, most of the scientists out there, they do not deny that the potential of Bigfoot is out there or that ghosts may be real or that UFOs and aliens are coming down to our planet. They deny the fact that people are having the experiences because eyewitness testimony is shady at best when it comes to credibility. Look, we all think we know what happened, but there is an old saying that says there are three sides to every story. What are those sides? Well, there's your side, there's the other side, and then there's the truth down the middle of what actually happened. Now, I know with my personal experiences, I've tried to be as skeptical as possible, but I also know, like a lot of you, I know what I saw. And It was uncomfortable with what I saw. It wasn't a reality that I was used to. 
And that probably is the same feeling the majority of you out there have had with your own encounters. The problem that we have today is basically people saying that if you don't trust the science, if you question the science, you're part of the problem. We hear that a lot in government today, where governments everywhere around the world are saying, if you don't trust us, you're part of the problem. It's quite a cliche that is built up over the last few years, isn't it? In many different subjects. Look, millions of people around the world cannot be wrong. Millions of people around the world claim to have seen Sasquatch or Yeti or Yowies, whatever they're called in your area. Many people around the world, millions in fact, claim to have witnessed UFOs and witnessed alien abductions or experienced alien abductions. They're not all wrong. And I'm tired of everybody chastising the experiencer when all the experiencer really wants to know is a simple question. Why me? Why is this happening to me? Look, I believe science needs to be studied in these fields. I'm not a science denier at all. And I realize that there are strict protocols that go along with scientific experiments, much more strict than I could ever imagine. That's why we have got the technologies and the infrastructure that we have today, whether it's bridges or flying planes or computers that we could talk to somebody in real time like I am to you right now. Those are great inventions. But with every new invention, there has to be a field of study that goes along with it. And I'm not one to shoot down scientists because we need science. We need mathematics. We need chemistry and biology and geology and the other ologies that are out there that have helped form our knowledge of this planet and the planets around us. That being said, if we are shooting down the idea that there is possibility that people are having these experiences, you have no leads. You have no information to look at. You don't just sit there and try and find information when there is no information there. It doesn't work that way. Now, I might not be explaining that very correctly. However, what I do know in my extremely primitive scientific mind is that science is about trying to expand knowledge, not trying to shoot it down because you don't believe. At what point have scientists become the type of people who use their personal opinion rather than the excitement of maybe finding something new out there? It's kind of contradictory to what a scientist is. What happened to the curiosity of science? That's what I would like to know. And when did we start trusting the government's opinion on things? Look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I sure know when there's smoke, there's fire, as we all should. And just because the media is not covering this subject to the degree it should, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any sort of, how can I put it, any sort of knowledge that things are actually happening that the government is not telling us about. There is a plethora of evidence out there, which skeptics be damned, shouldn't be put to the side because we don't want to believe Lou Elizondo or David Grush or other whistleblowers. We don't want to believe scientists like Avi Loeb or Gary Nolan who've worked their tails off. Does that mean after 50 years of study, Jacques Vallée all of a sudden knows nothing? And the funny part about it is the majority of people who are making these comments either do not have a college education, do not have any scientific background, or they don't even have a doctorate in knitting or thumb twiddling. Like, come on. I was always taught, respect your elders and respect those in their fields. I don't know why we've lost that respect because it's not all story time. Okay. It's not all about, about people just telling stories for the sake of trying to gain a 15 minutes of fame. 
there are real time things happening out there that we cannot explain. We want to explain it, but we can't. I can't explain what happened to me. I don't expect you to answer to me why things have happened to you. Because sometimes things just happen. What is the reason behind that? That's a different story. That we don't know. That is something that our curiosity should be there to solve. But if we're going to start believing the government on everything, because they're allegedly telling the truth about UFOs and other projects that they've worked on, like remote viewing and others, if we're all of a sudden going to take their word verbatim, when were we told that politics is now honesty? Name a politician that's been honest. They all make campaign promises. They all break those campaign promises. They all tell us they're going to get to the bottom of it, only to when elected, forget about that decision that they were going to make and those words that they promised. We've seen it time and time again, especially over the last 50, 60 years. It's ugly. It's obtuse. And it's not fair to the public. That being said, when it comes to UFOs, oh yes, we're going to believe everything that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick says, or Susan Goff says, or any other skeptic that doesn't want to talk about this topic. If the evidence isn't there for Kirkpatrick and others, where is it hiding? That's the follow-up question. Is it hiding at Lockheed Martin, at Skunk Works? Is it hiding at Area 51? Is it hiding at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio? There's a lot of people who are frustrated with this topic right now. The people who are trying to get the information out, like Courtney Marcassani, myself, and others, they are trying their hardest to bring information from people from the inside. And what do we do? We've waited for people for decades to come out and talk about this subject. And what do we do? We shoot them down. We shoot them down. Automatically, if, oh, they talked to that person, well, they're a liar. Or they've talked to another person or another media outlet, they're a liar. Where's the truth? Remember, people, Those who've had experiences or those who have had careers regarding this, they don't want to be in this position. Like I've said many times on this show, I lived a happily boring life before my experiences started, and it put me on a new career path that I never thought I would go down again, which is radio. Yes, I got my education in radio and broadcasting. But when I quit terrestrial radio in 2007, I wasn't coming back behind the microphone. I was done. Nine and a half years later of spaced out radio, we're still telling stories each and every night of people who've had amazing experiences and have conducted amazing research. I know that you guys want answers. I want answers as well. I'm tired of the trust me bro attitude that many people have. But I do also believe that there are good people out there who are trying their best to get the information out, but just cannot attach their name to it at this time. And the other argument that you've heard me say many a times, and I'll say it again, to sound like the broken record that I am. What is proof? In today's society, What is proof? Can't use photos anymore due to Photoshop. Nobody believes them. Can't use video anymore due to CGI and AI. And that technology is becoming so good and so improved that at times it's very hard to tell the difference between reality and imagery. We don't trust audio because it could be edited. We don't trust the human mind because it tells only portions of the story. So I want you to ask yourself, when you're sitting there asking, where's the proof? 
What is proof? When you can answer that without using the, the, the keynote term empirical evidence, there is no proof out there. The best evidence we have are the people who are experiencing it. That's it. That's the lead. Every police investigation out there starts with a clue. Sometimes the clue is small, like a gum wrapper. Other times, it's eyewitnesses who witness somebody running away from a car accident. Or worse. But we started somewhere, and it starts with the proof of the people. That's where the proof begins. And that's your Dave 101. Let's get to the news. What time is it? It's time for Shirky Pig's News. All right, let's get right to it. Here's a cool one from England. Like, don't you wish this would happen to you? Richard Brock has been metal detecting for 35 years, saying that the previous biggest nugget he had ever found in England weighed in at 54 grams. The treasure, though, that he's dug up is incredibly larger. The largest gold nugget ever found in England was dug up by a veteran metal detectorist. Yeah, Richard Brock drove three and a half hours from Somerset to Shrosfire for a group dig in a farmland on the hills. When he arrived, he found that his metal detecting kit was not working, and he had to break out his older faulty machine. However, that faulty machine really paid off. 20 minutes into the dig, he literally struck gold as Richard dug up a huge 64.8 gram golden nugget buried about six inches underground. Dubbed Hero's Nugget, the metal is believed to be the biggest find of its kind in English soil and is expected to fetch at least 30,000 pounds at the time of auction, which runs on April 1st. Brock, who has been metal detecting 35 years, said he thought he had missed the action. I couldn't believe it, he said. I turned up late to the event, was only there a matter of minutes, and this treasure hunting expedition was supposed to last all day. The deck detectorist made the rare find near the village of Much, uh, Much Wenlock, which is believed to have been an old track with railway lines that could have contained stones from Wales, an area known to be rich with gold. It just goes to show, he says, that it doesn't matter really what equipment you use. If you're walking over the find and are alert enough to know what might be lurking underneath the soil, that makes all the difference. Wow. Imagine that. That would be awesome. Vermont State University is offering a new class. University officials said a Harvard course on the music of Taylor Swift inspired the Vermont State University to create a class of their own based around a different sort of musician, Weird Al Yankovic. The class, led by Linden Music and Performing Arts Professor Brian Warwick, is titled, titled Weird Al and His Polkas, which the school said humorously echoes the title of Harvard University's Taylor and Her World. The school said while the class name and much of its subject matter is based around humor, students will also learn some serious concepts. Studying his work offers students a fun and engaging framework to study things like parody, song craft, and music production analyst. Warwick, who has worked as an audio engineer for Yankovic's two most recent albums, said the class won't cover just the musician's famous parody songs like Eat It or Amish Paradise. Al Yankovic's work is not just about the parodies. It's also about his tribute or pastiche songs where it is actually an original work by Al Yankovic. But he's paying tribute to another artist as well. Love Weird Al. Don't watch the movie, though. It's terrible. The Weird Al mu movie on Amazon, horrible, horrible movie. It's almost like a Pauly Shore movie type horrible. All right, let's talk some vampires here. Yeah. Modern-day vampire? 
That's what a 56-year-old man in Oregon claimed of his 79-year-old mother after he alleged to be driven to a makeshift wooden stake through her neck and killing her. Nice son. The Lincoln County Sheriff's Office claims Robert Bruce Poe called deputies on March 12th and alleged that he had accidentally killed his mother, Judy Moe. When questioned, police alleged the younger Poe said he believed his mother was a bloodsucker as she claimed she poked him at night and he'd wake up with blood on his sheets. When the cops arrived at the pair's home, they alleged that the accused man's hands and clothes were covered in blood while he held his mother's purse and a letter. Authorities say the body of his mother was found inside of the house near a 2004 gold Chrysler PT cruiser that appeared to be stuck in gravel. Court records state when deputies came closer, they saw a large round stake, which appeared to be the broken end of a garden tool protruding from her throat. Sheriff's office said the deceased had sustained injuries from the blunt force trauma to the head. Poe, previously arrested for numerous crimes since 1986, including possession of meth, DUI, and harassment, is charged with second-degree murder and unlawful use of a weapon. Wow. That's not very nice. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty much your news for this week. I don't know where you go from that, but I can tell you this. Mom's not a vampire. Nope. Mom is not a vampire. It's just something that this guy's going to have to deal with now that he's going to jail. Big thank you tonight to Ron Felber for coming in and talking to us about his brand new book on demonic possession. Thank you, Robin Haynes, for the cryptid report. As we say hello to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, LinkedIn, Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyrighted by Space Town Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. show people good show oh sometimes wearing those headphones drives me crazy oh where is I had the Dave 101 last week. Where is the audio now? That drive me nuts. Hmm. 
Hmm. That drive me nuts. Oh well. It happens. I'll get I'll get it read back for next next week. Okay, what am I doing here? I'm going like that. That's what I'm doing. Why it's not in its folder? That bugs me. Deveroni, the San Francisco treat. Right there. Thank you. I uh, didn't get to say thank you. Time to say thank you to Jeff and T Bone for the hat trick. Very much appreciate the love, everybody. Preston Beckett, how you doing? Moody Mogul. <clears throat> thank you for uh, noticing that, Moody. That actually means a lot. No, uh, the biopic uh, Paramarv with Daniel Radcliffe. It was horrible. A UFOC, how you doing? Honestly, it was it was terrible. Like it was seriously Pauly Shore not funny. Uh, T-Bone, what are you asking just once? I think I may have missed something. What am I missing, T-Bone? Trying to do too much at once here. Just once, please, Captain, if you don't mind. I, I don't know what that means, T-Bone. Please, please explain it for me. That's right, Pepe H. You never go wrong with Merling. Never go wrong with Merling. Am I blushing? Why would I blush? What am I supposed to be blushing about? Help me out, Deborah Rooney. Woo poo. That movie was freaking terrible.
<laughs> oh, no, I can't do that, T-Bone. I can't do that. I got to show my appreciation. My Twinkies comment. I didn't see your Twinkies comment, hun. See, I, I just don't find John Cena funny. He's like the beige Volvo of wrestling, the anti rock. Okay, where's my audio in? Is it right now? With your host, Dave Scott. And there we go, Ron. Cancel. So it's one or three. I will say this, as much as I'm not a John Cena fan, that guy does a hell of a lot for kids, man, especially for the uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. I think that's amazing. All right, on that note, I'm going to say good night to everybody. Tomorrow night on our show, G.O. Turner is here for UFO Science Chat, abductions and everything that we're talking about. It's going to be a great show tomorrow night. Big thank you to T-Bone with a hat trick, Simon Times 2, Joe Picks, Puck Elf, Jeff and Deborah Rooney for the Super Chats. Thank you to everybody who has hit follow on X as well as hit like and subscribe on YouTube here. Much love to everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night. Take care. Healthy, my friend. You too. We need bail money. Give me a call. Always, Dad. Take care. <laughs> you too.